Okay, so then please talk about um, program verification um, for costs and benefits. So, the internet also is more familiar with it. It's a reliable medical, may have servers that have been running for the last five years, or something like that. Um, but actually, sometimes it's kind of a contradiction. Um, uh, actually, so I didn't refer to the code. Uh, someone was mentioning this earlier this morning at the developer table. Um, you can get any part of the kernel and you can find a bug with the whole study. Um, so some of these bugs have well known patterns. So things like buffer overflow, the reference of null, and so on. And these are today all rather well covered by various kinds of tools, set, functional, compiler options, and so on. Um, on the other hand, Sorry, I'm not understanding the concept of how you switch from one slide to the Okay. Um, on the other hand, the questions of bugs are. Yeah. I want to put it in. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, on the other hand, the bugs that depend on the algorithm. So if you have some function, you're supposed to do something, it actually does something else. And none of these generic tools are going to help you find that issue. Um, so what we're interested in is considering whether formal verification can be useful to help address this problem. Uh, so what is formal verification? So the basic idea is um, that the developer or somebody can write specification some kind of formal notation that describes what the uh, function is supposed to be. And then tools can be used to check that the specification actually matches what the source code to get. And then one can scale up. You may have special functions. They may have um, their own specifications. They can check that they're all consistent with each other and then get some kind of uh, complete report on how your software is actually behaving. Um, so basically, you can think of specifications as sort of a form of pool of documentation, but documentation written in the English language or documentation written in some formal language. And the benefit is that you have some kind of tool support to understand the correct things, understand the relationship between things. Um, so the positive aspects, one of the positive aspects is just, I mean, I've emphasized already the tool support aspects, but also the idea of forcing you to think about your code in a different way and thinking about what you want it to do and seeing if it actually is doing that. Um, and then once you have the specifications, then they are also, in contrast to documentation right using English language, they're also completely unambiguous. And other people who are not familiar with the code base can study them later on and understand what's going on. Um, on the other hand, there's a downside. If anyone has ever tried to do formal verification of any code at all, you know, writing these specifications is very hard. And actually, we're kind of targeting these sorts of things that are not exactly sure what the function is doing. And so, writing a specification of what the function does when you're not completely understanding everything is even more complicated. Um, another that in the case of the Linux kernel, it's a uh, live test of software. It's going to change all the time. We have worked really hard to get our specifications to be in the perfect way. And then some food person has realized that actually your function can be called in some other context. And then you need to update the code in some way. And then you have to update the specifications. Again, they're describing exactly what the code does. When the code changes, you might have to change everything. Um, and the maintenance, like who's going to do this maintenance? So we might hire a verification engineer to write the original specification. If we do a one-line change, are we going to call him up and ask him to update the specifications? Maybe is there any help that developers can do that themselves? I don't know. We can think about it. And if you don't if you write the specification that describes the wrong thing, then you can verify that your code does what the specification does. But it won't necessarily be actually what you had in your head that the function was supposed to be. So it kind of formalizes things, makes them precisely the point, but it's not the perfect insurance that you would be perfectly good. Um, so in this part of the talk, it's important to be 
not a uh, order that you just go out and follow this methodology that I'm going to describe. It's more of a thought experiment. Um, what? Uh, so I don't want you to say, oh, you know, I don't. This is like a real nuisance. I don't want to go out and now that I've been working on my code, I don't want to have to go out and write formulas. Well, so this one don't think so much about the burden that this is going to add to the developer. The point of this point is just to think about what kind of benefits we can get from it. If we feel like we could get some benefits from it, then maybe we can make some tools afterwards that we can reduce the benefit the burden on the developers, maybe. Um, so here's a simple example that's inspired by a talk from last year at Linux New, um, a very nice small Linux conference in Spain. Um, some of the on audience uh, would enjoy to come and attend that. Um, so this is the top functions of the arguments. They're both pointers, and it's going to reference those arguments, and it's going to take the value from one and put it into the other, and so very simple function. Um, there are some things we might like to verify. Uh, we might like to verify that our incoming pointers are actually valid pointers. Um, they're not null pointers, for example, that they are actually pointed in my memory that's going to can be written. They're not pointing into some console space. Um, and then we would also like to verify that if we get the kind of pointers that we expect, that the values will actually end up being swapped in the end. Uh, so I we're going to do this verification using a tool called Thomas. And um, Premacy is the automatic tool for doing verification. Basically, the developer, the user, has to write the verifications, and then Premacy is going to take care of the issue of um, figuring out what the state code was. So, the specifications basically describe the state on the way in and describe the state that the state at the end. And the, the same statements in your function are going to determine the conditions under which actually achieve your goal. So we're promising to take care of analyzing all those statements and figuring out what conditions have to be checked. Um, and then it relies on SMP solvers to do all of the checking. So except for writing specifications, everything should be automatic. So in some sense that's good news. Um, so here are the post conditions and specifications that we want to write. Uh, first, we have our preconditions. What are the situations in which we can call this function? Um, one of them that I mentioned, we have our pointers, our pointer picture, that our pointers are readable and writable. Um, so that's what we have here. Requires the premise notation for specifying this is a condition. This is the property that we require to hold on when we call the function. And we just want to be sure that these two pointers are valid pointers, meaning that they can be both read and written. Um, and then the other thing is to actually ensure that we have the right behavior, that we're swapping the value. Now we say ensure, ensure this is the secret. This is the post condition, this is describing the state as we could have it as we when we reach the end of the function. And we want to ensure a nice thing about this whole verification process that this is something that's done statically, it's not done at the execution. And then we want to refer to the values of variables at different points in time. So we want to say the value that P is storing at the end is equivalent to the value that Q was storing at the beginning. So we have this word it does give us the old value. And you can actually put the values at any point in the function definition. So we have this picture for the first condition for P, and we have another one here for Q. Um, so now we're all done. We're almost all done. The friend also wants to know about the side effects. So we have side effects for P and Q also. Uh, here is our complete specification for the top function. We can click the button, drop this into pharmacy, and um, basically one second later it will tell us everything is good. Um, so now we know that our swap function satisfies the specification that we provided for. Okay, so we want to do something a bit more interesting. So we targeted some functions in the Linux class scheduler. We're just going to focus on one function in this class. It's called shaping balance. Um, basically, what we're going to do is we'll take focus on a particular function, um, but that function might be referring to other functions, macros, data structures, stuff like that. We have to go around and collect all of that information. Uh, the other functions, uh, they might be kind of somehow lower in the abstraction hierarchy of the Linux table. When you look at some of these functions, unfold them a bit, eventually you get to assembly language, you get to 
some strange fee operations that you might not want to have to think about in your verification process. So we're just thinking about our particular function. For those other functions, we can just put a prototype and put what we expect that their behavior will be. If we like, we can verify that at some time in the future, but that's not the point of this particular experiment. Uh, and it also for you, uh, pharmacy, for proofing. Um, we are also, again, just focusing on the algorithm. We're not focusing on concurrent solutions. We're not focusing on strange quality references. Um, those are definitely important problems. Uh, but what we kind of the unique point about what we're doing here is that we can actually focus on what the function is doing, what its algorithm is trying to implement. Um, so we need those other things. Um, other. Okay, so the function we're interested in is called quickly balanced. Um, this is a function that is part of the load balancer of the Linux kernel. Basically, the different things that are invoking the load balancer, many of them may be invoking the load balancer basically at the same time. And it's not very really desirable for multiple systems to be trying to handle work from other systems at the same time because they will all have access to the same information and they will thus all likely try to steal the same task. So, what could be balanced as Basically, just like a, a good speaker, it says that the CPU is currently allowed to do load balancing. This is going to return to the cost in the end. Um, so, the history of this function, it was first proposed in uh, August 2013. It was actually just a function that was refactored out of code and other functions. And uh, a kind of interesting thing is in the refactoring process, it's basically some copy paste with some scattered lines. Uh, the typical integration. So it's whenever you introduce something new, you have a new change of algorithm, something like that, that's where bugs are likely to happen. Bugs, not necessarily the kinds of bugs that multi pointer view references and so on. Um, the patch for the was first reported in a release in um, Linux 3.12, and actually, the bug that was in the initial version was found very quickly, and so the initial release and was not containing the bugs. Um, and then the function has changed a bit over time. It doesn't change like every day. Um, but there have been basically 10 different variants of the function over the last few years. Okay, so I was going to first start with the overview of how it's been used. It's not that complicated as well, but it's written in a strange way, so it's a bit easier to understand it from where. Um, basically, we have our inputs, which is the CPU, which is trying to push. And we have some other information about the other, basically the state of the machine, the set of systems that we're allowed to steal from first. Um, and the action is a three-stage process. Basically, what the super balance function is going to do is going to try to elect the CPU which is allowed to do balancing. And then after we have elected that one, then we see if the CPU is throwing the function is actually the one that won the function. So basically, the idea of this election process is deterministic. If we have a bunch of systems who are calling the function, then we can do that concurrently with no interaction between them, but they will all elect the same one. And so we only get one out the other. Um, basically, we would like to elect one that is idle, um, because if it's idle and you put work on an idle system, then it will work with the one immediately, so that's desirable. But if we don't find an idle one, then we just allow another one that's chosen in a deterministic way to um, So here's the actual code. Uh, it's not a huge function, but it does have a bunch of ifs, it has a bunch of loops, it has some strange breaks and continues. It's not completely essential to see what it's doing. Um, so it has various parts. We have our inputs, which are the environment, which is the system we get in. Asking for load balancing, what the system is going to steal from. Um, then it has the condition. The special condition is if the system is completely idle, if it is like working along doing something, but that process has ended, then it is always allowed to steal. If you keep the system active, then it will um, be able to steal at a high frequency and do the best. Um, so it's desirable to get some work there immediately. Otherwise, we go into the selection process that I described. Uh, so again, we have the two parts. The first part is the loop. In the loop, we iterate over the cores from core number zero up to the maximum one. 
and we see if a core is somehow a desirable one based on some mass, but I don't specifically wonder if from zero up to the maximum. And we see do we find idle one? And then if we can find idle one, then we store that in the variable balance system view, who is the winner of the election, and we exit from the loop. And if we never find the idle one, then we get to the bottom of the loop, and this variable is still negative one, and then we just return, we, we erect some random value in a deterministic way. And then the last step is to check if the elected relationship between the elected one and the system that's trying to run the function. And here you can see the problem. Um, it, it returns when the elected one is different from the system that's running the function, so actually, all of the CPUs on the machine would try to do load balancing at the same time, except the one that was supposed to do load balancing. So that was not very good. Um, but the case is quite simple. We just changed not equal. Um, so we have three and post conditions. So first, there's a bunch of things that I don't show uh, up here at the top. These are checking the validity of the various culture arguments. Um, those are actually practice quite hard to do, but they are not super interesting to look at. Um, so what I'm going to show instead are the pre and post conditions. So, so we have another construct of premise that's illustrated here, which is the behavior. Um, so basically the idea is when I describe the algorithm, there's two different um, situations in which we call this function, and the function is going to behave different ways in those different situations, and each one of them corresponds to different behavior. So the first behavior is when the invoking system is, is new to idle. The second behavior is when there is some idle system and we are able to elect one. And the third behavior is when there is no idle system and we have to use the default definition. Um, so this is the post conditions for the function. Um, unfortunately, it's a small detail of uh, program verification. We are very good at working on loops. Um, so, as I mentioned, um, from the screen, we're going to go through, we're going to look at our specification, and we're going to go through the statements in the function one by one, and see what's the relationship between the exposition of those statements and the formula that we're trying to figure out. But if we have a loop, we, we don't know what is the actual sequence of statements that we're executing, because you do the top part, and then you might go around 25 times or 150 times, so we don't know. There's no way to... Um, the premise can figure that out. And so what we do instead is, instead of having to figure out how many times we go around the loop, the user has to write what's called the loop invariant, and so that describes some property every time we go around the loop. And so then we can just kind of jump over the loop and use that invariant information to figure out how to continue. Um, so here the loop invariant is not that complicated. Basically, we have the idea that we are looking, we have this loop index that's going to move the possible systems, and all of the systems that have been checked so far are not idle. If they had been idle, we would have left a loop. So, by definition, all of the ones we've seen so far are not idle. And so, that's the first line here. The other information is from some information that's necessary. We need to know about the side effects of the loop, and we also need to ensure that the loop is going to terminate. But the part is how we get around each of them. Um, so now we have our loop invariants. We have, we have our pre and post conditions. We have our loop invariants. We are completely done with everything we need to write for our specifications. And we can run uh, for MSC, and it says yes in about one minute. And so when I did this initial experiment, I had not very much experience with MSC, and this took maybe a couple of days to get it right. Um, so it's not completely trivial. It's not completely difficult. With some experience now, I could probably do that more quickly. Um, the problem, of course, is the best statistical version of the function. And as I mentioned, there have been lots of other variants of the function since then. Um, you can see that there are different things. Some of them are uh, quite simple, replacing not equals by equals. That's one character that changes, but it's actually convert from buggy version to correct version. Um, some things are like replacing function names, which are quite simple to deal with. Uh, and see some of them actually get a bit more complicated. So I'll go through some of these um, changes and we can see what are the impact on the um, 
So the first thing is, is, is the proposal and who, how much growth rate is there going to be to update the state of the um, We do have one point which is in our favor, and that is that the, so if we don't have any loop triggers, the proposed conditions are just lagging the separation at the beginning of the function, the separation at the end of the function. And so if our input output behavior is changed, if we just do some refactoring or some optimization along the way, um, then if the input and output values stay the same, then our pre and post conditions should be the same. And from the same, we'll take care of adapting to the new structure. So we some hope that we have no work to do at all, but as we saw, uh, there can be some changes that happen, um, for example, to fix the bug that was in the initial version, and there's no magic bullet. Um, if we're going to fix the bug, obviously we're going to change the input output. Okay, we're going to have to change this. Um, so uh, this is uh, kind of for the good cases, and moving on to the less good cases. There are some changes that have actually no impact at all. Um, so one of the changes is somebody putting cleaned up all the comments that are in lower case and into upper case um, and some other similar, uh, you know, readability fixes. So obviously that has no impact on the uh, verification. So you feel very productive. Uh, you get the variant without any work at all. Um, but something a bit more interesting here: somebody actually does a bit interesting refactoring of the code. Um, but this, is, this has no impact on the input and output behavior. So the idea is I mentioned that there's two parts to the election. In the loop, if we find something, then um, some developer realized we don't have to store it in a balanced CPU variable and test that variable afterwards. We already have enough information. We can just leave the loop with the answer that we would have given anyway. So again, no, no changes in the input-output behavior. We just push the button and frame a state. Oh, so that's green. Um, another issue that has arisen is that somebody realized that the function could be called in some circumstances very different than the ones that was initially anticipated. Uh, so here's the condition that is being under consideration is that actually this uh, load balancing can happen as part of handling an interrupt. And in parallel, we can be doing other things on the machine. We can be plugging CPU. And so it will not be desirable to load balance um, work onto a CPU that is about to be um, So the, the handled in the code is very simply by just adding an if statement at the top of the function. And it's handled fairly simply in the specification as well um, because we have a new behavior. This kind of shows the advantage of breaking these things down into the different behaviors. We just focus on your particular behavior that you are working on at the moment. We have a new behavior for this situation, um, but unfortunately, it has the property that uh, there's no like if then else in our specification language. So if we add a behavior for a new condition, we have to update all the other behaviors to say that that new condition does not hold. Um, so at least the change is kind of. Uh, I mean, it's a change in most cases. Uh, one can kind of get the feel for this is the kind of thing one has to do. So I would say it's a, you know, a little bit of work, but not too complex. On the other hand, there can be much more intrusive changes that have happened in this function. Um, so at some point, somebody thought it would be a good idea to put hyper threads into account. Hyper thread is like a uh, logical CPU, that is basically it's circular, it's a logical CPU. Um, but several logical CPUs may be implemented on a single physical CPU to take um, um, pipelining into account or benefit better from pipelining. Um, but unfortunately, that I mean, gives you a bit more performance, but it doesn't scale perfectly. And so if you're going to store work onto the CPU, it might be advantageous to store work onto a CPU where all of the hyper threads are idle. Then it will run as fast as possible and it will not annoy other tasks that are running on hyper threads. Um, so we would like to do that. One way we can do that is to search through all the cores to find one that is completely idle in this sense, and then we can search through all the systems again if we don't find one, and find it one that was idle in the way we were looking at before, just looking at the CPU, the logical CPU. Um, but having two iterations over all the CPUs might seem to be um, so they had the idea, um, you have one, just one iteration, and you have this variable which is called idle SMT, and that's going to be our fallback. That's a CP 
prove that it's idle, but some of its hyper threads are not idle. And if we never find a fully idle system, then we will fall back to idle SMP1. So the logic has gotten a bit more complicated. And so um, the display also has an impact inside of a loop. Whenever you work on verification, anything inside of a loop is much more frightening than things outside of a loop um, because you have to update the loop invariance. Uh, so that's what we had to do. Um, so people say I emphasize that there was like one line that's interesting in the loop invariance. Saying uh, all the, among the systems that we've looked at so far, they are all not idle. Um, now, inside of our loop, we have this loop that's like a loop partition. We have to see has idle SMT been initialized already? Has it not been initialized? What is the properties of idle, the idle SMT thing if it has been initialized? So, it's a lot more information that we have to get back um, So, here we have a sort of slightly complicated loop. And maybe it's kind of a bit complex thing. It's kind of a curve, like the exponential curve, like this, and the complexity of change is very new. Um, and then, um, in a quite recent version, people decided to be even more efficient. Um, so these hyper threads have the property that they are all sort of like an equivalent to us. So if three and five, if five is a hyper thread of three, then um, three is a hyper thread of five. And so once we check one CPU, then we have actually checked all of its hyper threads for idleness. There's no point to check them for idleness again. And so we can remove them from the list of things that we are iterating over. Um, so, in general, this idea of remove, you know, we have we did our nice iteration over some things, but now we're going to remove some future things. Um, I don't know, maybe you can appreciate that this is a bit of a complex thing to think about. Um, and so, unfortunately, for the thing that I am trying to put forward, this took us like three months of effort to figure out how to make it work. Um, so it really kind of undermines my talk, but um, <laughs> I hope that um, maybe we can improve things and get experience and uh, learn about good uh, methodology for dealing with these kinds of issues and maybe less quickly at the same time. Um, on the other hand, on the upside, the algorithm is breaking. This optimization was not done completely correctly. And we have actually go back to the case where there's not exactly one unique uh, CPU that's going to be allowed to do a load balancing. Now there can be two CPUs that are allowed to do, do load balancing in some cases. Uh, we can actually see the bug in these um, invariants that we are able to pull. Okay, so I don't really expect you to put it all up on these invariants here. But um, in the open version, you can see here in the red part, there is a so we have an if and only if. So we give a true result if and only if our CPU of interest is the one that we are uh, we have elected. And if we look at the bottom, there is no more if and only if. It works one way, but it doesn't work the other way because sometimes there's two systems, as I mentioned. And if you study up on the code, um, again, this is a bit complex, but the no if condition that's not testing the right thing in the fault we place, um, and it's allowing uh, on a failure to match the election allows you to just um, try another case as well. Um, so basically, uh, we have our assessment here. Here we have our list of our changes as we saw before. Uh, so basically, changes one through seven were quite easy to verify. So some of them, a few minutes of work, some maybe 20 minutes, you know, not maybe a couple days of work to do actually all of them. And with not that much experience with tools there. And then on the other hand, the last two changes were much more complex. Uh, just taking into account hyper threads, one day of work, and then as I mentioned, doing the passive optimization based on the hyper threads took months of work. Um, kind of interesting is that these SMP solvers are basically simply solving a like you have some knowledge and then you infer things from that knowledge and so you can expand and expand and expand your knowledge base and then try to see if the thing that you're trying to prove is actually somewhere in the knowledge base. So it's a huge space and you're just trying to fix in that space. Um, if it's trying to find the thing that it's trying to prove, it's very rare that it will actually tell you 
this thing is wrong, most of the time it'll just say, I don't know. I will just work and work and work, however much time you allow it to work. And then it says, I don't know in the end. Um, so it's hard to get really quick feedback. If you write the system is incorrect, it will often just run for a long amount of time and then you'll have no information whatsoever. So that's really a, a bottleneck in getting these things to actually find the right thing. Um, so going forward, um, obviously we would like to work on some more functions. At this point, we have moved on one other function, which is um, select idle core, which is also part of the scheduler and also has a similar behavior where we're searching for cores to find a suitable one. Um, our observation so far is that simple changes in the code lead to simple changes in the specifications. That slightly complex changes in the code lead to very complicated changes in the specification. Um, so maybe we have to adjust it accordingly. Um, we have also been thinking about some tools that can help in this sort of work. Uh, one of them is just like the question of what do we want to verify? If we want to focus on one particular function. You probably don't want to take the entire file, the entire Linux kernel, anything like that. Um, so we have already made a tool that will just take the function, find all of its dependencies, and make it into one little file that compiles, and there's a complete um, specification for that function. Um, so that's a lot in doing experiments. Another uh, thing, uh, tool that would be potentially useful is in writing the specifications. So there's two parts to that. One of them is getting all these declarations associated with the pointers to be in the right shape. And one of them is figuring out what your function actually is doing and trying to express that. Often figuring out what your function is doing and trying to express that is not that hard. And doing all of the analysis to figure out which pointers might be pairing with each other ones is uh, much more complicated. But it's something that easy for tools to do. So maybe some kind of tool based on LLVM, which is already doing alias analysis, could be helpful in that direction. Um, and also another is the loop for the Linux kernel. The loop for the Linux kernel has various iteration operators that are defined as very complicated macros. Um, in this talk, we saw CPU, 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 CPU and um, that just starts from zero and goes to the end. That's fairly simple as an iterator. But the in the um, select idle core that we looked at, um, it is a uh, for each CPU wrap. And wrap starts in the middle of the set of CPUs and goes to the end and goes around. And the driving that goes around goes to the end and goes around adds a lot more complexity. Um, so it could be possible to make some kind of templates for different kind of loop iterators, and then you can just insert the actual behavior of the loop and it will figure out all of the rest about the iteration. Um, another issue is uh, how can we help to react to code changes? Uh, even, I mean, ideally, we could have a tool that was specifications that might be a bit much to ask for, but it could be interesting to have a tool that provides some hints that can help identify if this change that's easy to deal with, if this change that's hard to deal with, might actually help the user in terms of expectations. Um, and another issue. If you're not able to uh, prove the thing you're expected to, maybe you need to update it in some way, then maybe that indicates a bug in your source code. How can you identify what kind of bug it is and actually make the connection between the update and specification and the source code? And so everything that I presented in this talk is available online if you want to see the actual talk. So thank you very much. Uh, let's have the microphone here. Yeah. 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 How do you handle the compound logic statements? Is it went out here? Uh, 
So I understand compound and what do you mean by compound logic? Do you mean just lots of or long compound logic? Um, yeah, I don't think that. Um, but I mean, I that. Does that. So it has difficulty, like if you don't have difficulty, you know, I can imagine you have some kind of complexity. Um, so SMT solver will work very slow if it has some complexity. I don't touch that. I just wait. I um, have some coffee or I um, do some other work. Or this is something you have to learn from, you know, parallel process. Does uh, the language under analysis change things? Implying basically the thing that we do with analysis on the rest of the code. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So when we, um, when we were doing this thing, it took eight months. We got very, very enthusiastic about Rust. We thought Rust was a great language and everything. Um, so, yeah, I think we could help the Guide you, and you have the new version of this one, so that guides you. I think you can guide you in writing some of these specifications, which are really very about the pointers, which are very hard, and you can also guide you in knowing you don't have to write those specifications because there's no, um, you know, mutability that's possible in some cases. Basically, we have, um, you know, you might have two different structures, they might have the same type, one of them is modified, one of them is not, and so. Modified, do it's not modified, and basically you have to stay separated. So you have to declare that these things are not connected to each other. Otherwise, you will lose any information. You lose all your information about this one when you have any connections to the other one. So there a target that you think that might be and if not, um, I guess we can So, the question is, have I found some rust functions that I should be working on? Oh, yeah, no, I haven't done that. Okay, uh, got it. They were also working on verification for rust, but I'm not sure if they're working on this kind of actual behavior of the functions. People are often working on verifying the verifier or um, verifying some issues related to concurrency and things like that. My hope, my hope, or something like that. Actually, I've seen it in the image of my talk at the microconference last year. The thing that I don't think is understand about the load balancer. Um, so I'm hoping that after many long efforts of searching and looking at the code and so on, maybe if I try to verify it, maybe then I will under maybe the thinking will become clear. Um, so I will actually the entire load And another thing that would be interesting to do is select idle sibling with the, at the code that decides where you can ask when you do come up. Uh, that has gone undergone similar kind of operational evolutions, and there have been very strange bugs in the past, like a variable, that, you know, it's like it's an integer variable, and they use long integer variables, things like that. So it seems like verification could have been useful in that case as well. Um, I'm not sure I'm ambitious enough to change the entire Linux kernel. That seems a bit much. Um, There's a question kind of behind the pillow, if you can get it back there. I am wondering if Definitely. And um, we found a bug using, um, you know, in doing this work, we found a bug, and we submitted the bug, and it was accepted and all that. And But I can't say that we found the 
bug using the verification, we found the bug trying to think about what are all the pathways for conducting this function and what they do. Are they actually doing the function is supposed to? Um, so I can say that the verification, you know, like as you say, what SMT solver didn't find the bug first. It will never find bugs. Basically, SMT solvers only tell you when things work. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you can find this one bug, but it's another bug. And so you, it does give you the happy feeling that you have actually fully correctly characterized your code. So I think there's some value to going through the whole process and, and not just pretending you're going to do it. Um, and just in the thought part. Please. Thank you. Uh, how do you think about writing this presentation and how are you um, how it's a lot of complexity in what you did. Yeah. So how you know so, uh, who can who can do the who can write the presentation and uh, you know can we expect that everybody will be able to do it? Um yeah, I think we can hope for the session, but I've heard I don't come to the this, so I don't have to think about the system. I've heard about other people who have some kind of uh, basic functional programming course. So if you're not familiar with functional programming, functional programming allows you to express things in quite a high level and so you end up with quite simple looking functions and the a little bit complicated things. So it's more than you can do in like you can do two lines of functional language and you might get something a bit more interesting than you might have three lines of code. So it's kind of a good situation in which to start doing that. Um, so I know people who have taught functional programming and formal verification at the same time. So second year course may be something like that. Um, I don't know. Um, it, 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 you can sell it as group program practice. You know, you think about documenting the code and making test cases for the code and writing specifications for the code and actually writing your code. All of these things can somehow, somehow flow together. Um, a question up here? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. I have a question. Sorry. This is maybe more philosophical, but I think I can explain the other ideas that we're seeing, but I'm assuming they're just supposed to be the human as potentially an error in expressing the logic of the function and the function is difficult. Like, and the, the formal verification is very difficult to express. So, like, it's Point that um, it's easy to see how to extend the, the specifications, maybe it's that you can change and no one needs to think about it. But um, as I showed in the table with the, this table here, uh, whenever there was a complicated change, then it took a lot of work to do the verification, but there was also a bug. So I don't know if, I mean, I don't know if we can generalize from just the history of one function, but I think there's some promise in what you're suggesting, yeah. Another question up here. Yeah, so that gives you some information about what should be expected. And then you have to go work on the verification of those pillars to ensure that the 
they're calling the function of IYC. So you have a function A, and you work very hard on making your specifications for A, and now function B is going to call function A. So you can you may need to write some specifications for B also, um, and then you can just drop it all in the tool. So we can like I can make write any specification for function B. Yeah, I mean, it depends. So if you have a pointer that comes into B, and then that pointer gets passed off to A, and B wants to be sure that it's a valid pointer, that it can be dereferenced, for example, then on, on B, you are going to have to also write your preconditions to say that it's a valid pointer. You have to be able to know that. So you have to write some preconditions. Yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Um, I can't help you. If your SMT cover doesn't work, uh, for instance, as you have several SMT covers, so you can help for. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. Um,